Uh, let's take a look at Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 11, but our message is going to focus on 1 through 3 today. I got into my study and realized that going to 11 was going to go to Tuesday. So we, we, we want to bite, bite-sized chunks here. But let's, let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Lord, we do come before you again. We, we thank you for the privilege of meeting together. We thank you that, um, I guess first, I, I thank you for working in the lives of those songwriters, the men and women who, who wrote these songs that, that we can raise our voices to, praising your name and speaking truths about you and your word. We thank you for the men and women that are willing to lead our worship, singing and, 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 and taking the time to, to practice and prepare. We thank you for that. <clears throat> we pray now, Lord, as we open up your word, we pray that you would, uh, you, you would focus our minds just for the next few moments. I, I pray that we would be able to set aside the distractions of the, the world around us. I pray that we would be able to focus on your word, your message to us. Challenge us, Lord. Encourage us, but challenge us. And I pray that as we leave here today, you would send us out as a, as a people who want to proclaim this truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the children can be dismissed for a children's church. All right, so last week we finished the section of Paul's letter addressing Christian unity. We spent several weeks talking about Christian unity. Paul challenged Christians to work and live out the gospel together. And we, we kind of live in a culture that is, uh, we all like to be lone rangers. You know, we have, this, especially when it comes to Christianity, we get, me and Jesus got our own thing going. You know, there's, a, there's an old uh, southern gospel song uh, of that name. And sometimes as, as American Christians, we think that that's, this is a, a, a one-on-one sport, and what we see in Scripture, especially being challenged by Paul, is that the church is a, is a team sport. We work together. We, we need to be involved in each other's lives. We need to be involved in, in each other's ministries. Not as busy bodies, not as uh, uh, looking over someone's shoulders, you know, but encouraging. Hebrews 10 talks about uh, provoking one another to righteousness. I love that word, provoke. <laughs> Now, but that's, that's the call. That's been what Paul has been talking about, challenging us to, to uh, live together, live out the gospel together, without selfishness, without prideful aspirations. None of us is building his own little kingdom or her own little kingdom. Paul used his own life as an example. He used the life of Jesus, who emptied himself, who, was, who, who deserved all the glory, and yet set that aside. To, to minister to people who didn't even deserve to be ministered to. The last couple of weeks, we've talked about Timothy and Epaphroditus. Uh, 
Tim, uh, Paul uses those guys' examples. And remember, those guys aren't the, the superstars. They're the nobodies. Epaphroditus, the only thing we really know about him is what Paul says in this letter. Timothy was the young guy that Paul had to say, don't let anyone despise you for your youth. Be an example. Live out. Earn the respect. So that's the section that we finished up last week. Now Paul is going to begin the next section of his letter. And his challenge in the first three verses, he's going to lay out three, uh, three distinguishing characteristics of real believers, of true, true Christ followers. And again, uh, at the beginning of the week, I was, I was looking to, to walk through this entire passage, and, and it's just there's too much. Uh, we, we could probably buzz through it really quickly, but I don't think that did, did uh, any favors to the text. So we want to look at these first three verses that really lay out three characteristics of Christ followers. And again, in, in America, now the culture's changing. We've talked about this a lot. You know, things are changing, but it's still really easy to profess Christianity. Oh, I'm a Christian. I don't read the Bible, and I'll go to church, and I don't like those churchy people, but I'm a Christian. It's easy to say that. But in these first three verses, Paul gives some characteristics of what a, what a real believer is, what a, what a truly converted person, a, tr- a real Christ follower is. And this, again, this is important because it's easy to assume ourselves or others to be in the faith without the, any accompanying evidence. Uh, the, the, the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Bible is, is full of, you know, by their fruits you shall know them. It's, as, as we, and, and again, we're not the final arbiters. I don't, have, I don't have the final authority to declare who is in the faith and who is not in the faith. But the scriptures are very clear that there will be fruit, there will be outgrowth, there will be, there will be signs of true faith, of a changed life. And too many times we have people who claim to be in the faith, claim to be something, and there is zero accompanying evidence. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty, many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, this is another one of those examples. The, the people who believe in a hippie Jesus, the let's just get along Jesus, don't like this passage. Because this is the same Jesus that appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. This is the Jesus who's not a pushover. And what he's describing here, and it's interesting because as a kid, I remember being taught about wolves in sheep's clothing, people who know they're not in the faith, but they pretend they are. That's not what Jesus is describing in, in these verses. He's describing people that they, they, they want to worship God their own way. And when they, get to, when they get to judgment time, when they get to stand before the Almighty, and he says, no, you're not one of mine. I don't know you. Whoa, 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 we, we, we did stuff for you. We, we, we cast out demons. We, we did stuff in your name. And the answer is, well, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know you. You, you didn't come in through the gate. You didn't come in through the door. You tried to come in your own way. This is people who believe. They're not purposeful frauds. They believe they're in the faith, and, but aren't. They're shocked to find out that their, their, their name isn't written in the book. So as we unpack the, the first three verses of this section, I want to examine, I want each of us to examine our lives. I want to challenge us. Are we moving in the direction of these three characteristics? And again, it's, this is a, it's a hard topic because if we look at ourselves, all of, every single one of us will look at our lives and go, ooh, I'm not doing this perfectly. And I've heard people that try to, to get Christians to question their faith because you don't live out the gospel perfectly. And that's not what, I'm, that's not what we want to go today. Sanctification is a, is a progress, is a process. It's, it's progressive. I love when a young person gets saved, but you don't expect a young person who trusts Christ to know the deep intricacies of the gospel. 
They know enough to trust Christ. And then they grow in that faith. They grow in their Christ-likeness. We can't expect to be perfect right out of the gate. But we should be growing toward Christ-likeness. We should all be able to look at our lives and maybe even look back five years from now. Have I grown in my Christ-likeness? Have I grown in my knowledge of Christ? Have I grown in my, my ability to live like Christ? So that's our challenge. Examining our lives. Am I growing in these characteristics? And even in our ministry efforts, as we minister to a community, and I, and I think this is fascinating. I've, uh, living here in the Bible Belt, we're kind of like the top of the belt buckle of the Bible Belt, right? Um, everyone's a Christian here. I've not met anybody in two years that would say, well, I'm not a, I'm not a Christian. Most everyone would say, yeah, well, I'm a Christian. Uh, so you ha- it's, it's an easy thing to say, I'm a Christian. So how do we distinguish, as we're ministering to a community out here, how do we know whether we're encouraging, challenging a fellow believer? And that's a viable part of ministry. It's a big part of ministry. Or am I evangelizing a lost person? Well, these characteristics will help us make that, that decision, uh, help inform our ministry. So let's jump right in. Let's jump to it. Three distinguishing characteristics of the true Christ follower. Paul begins by saying, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. The first characteristic is Christians rejoice. He says that word finally. Now, this is, this is, uh, this is kind of like a Baptist preacher saying finally after the second point of a six-point message. You know, have you ever had that guy? I try not to do it. Sometimes I do, but I try not to. Like at the end of point one, finally, and everyone's starting to get excited and then they start to pack up a little bit and then he just keeps going. That's kind of what Paul's doing, though, here, because this, this word finally doesn't mean I'm ending. It literally means furthermore. It's not a conclusion so much as a transition. So he's, he's ending one section of his letter, and he's beginning another. So uh, we don't get excited, but that, that it's going to wind down real quick. He says, finally, my brothers, and again, he's talking to believers. That word uh, is, is a delphos. Uh, in the context, it means my, my fellow believers, so brothers and sisters. Some translations use the word sisters too, my brothers and sisters. Um, it says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Uh, the Greek word behind rejoice means to be exceedingly glad or to have a deep confidence in something. This word joy is not synonymous with happiness. And our, our culture doesn't get that. I think we've probably been in, in God's word enough that we get that. I know I've said it multiple times that joy and happiness are not the exact same thing. There's some overlap. I mean, hap, there, there are moments when joy and happiness work together in our lives. We're, we're joyful and happy. But there are times when they're not. So joy isn't synonymous with happiness. Happiness is transitory. It comes and goes with ease. You think uh, you, get up, you get up one morning and try to start the car for work and it won't start. Well, guess what? That car won't start equals unhappy. Unless you didn't want to go to work that day, then maybe you're happy. But if you want to get to work, you want to get there, car won't start unhappy. You can't, really can't do anything about that. So you pack up, you, when, when you, you go to the new car dealer and you buy a new car and you drive off the lot with a shiny new car equals happy, right? Those, those are examples. And, and that's part of life. Happy, unhappy comes and goes with ease. Joy is the deep confidence that even in, in unhappy times, we can trust Christ. Even when my car won't start, when the world is crumbling around me, Christ is in control. That's joy. That's what Paul is talking about. Rejoice in the Lord. Have deep confidence in Christ. James 1, verses 2 through 4, James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, mature, and complete, lacking nothing. Count it joy when you meet trials. Count it, be joyful when you, when you face obstacles, when there's hurdles in your way. How in the world? But, he, but again, he doesn't say be happy about it. 
He doesn't say put on a plastic smile. He says count it all joy. I think you might be able to use an a illustration, uh, uh, an athlete who pushes himself, battles. I remember reading about Walter Payton. He was a running back for the Chicago Bears back in the 70s and early 80s. Um, he was one of the greatest running backs of all time. I'm a Detroit guy, so Barry Sanders is, is ahead of him. But, uh, but Walter Payton was this incredible athlete, but he pushed himself. His, I've, I've read about his training regimen. He would go to the field, and he would literally run sprints until he passed out. And then we woke up, he'd get up and do some more. And then he'd finally go home. But the guy pushed himself to the point of failure so that when he got onto the field, he could push beyond what the other players could do. But I guarantee there's no happiness. When you're running laps and you're running sprints and the world starts to, you know, you got to get in the tunnel vision and you lose consciousness, you're not happy about that. There's no happiness there. But I guarantee when he woke up, <laughs> what's going on here? There's a, there, there's a confidence, man, this, this is going to get me where I need to be in this sport. There's a joy that comes with it, but not a happiness. And I think the same thing is true even more so spiritually. Certainly we're not going to be happy about trials. We're not going to be happy about, about challenges. But there's a joy because, man, as you, as you go through something, as you see God bring you through a difficulty, what happens the next time you have that difficulty? I'm not afraid of it. I, we, we were joking this weekend because we went up to Illinois and I was talking to a pastor friend of mine and how, how his church in Illinois went through COVID. And they, they did some of the same things we have done, but as you know about Illinois, they had a few more uh, uh, requirements. So they, they had a few more hurdles to jump through. And, and I, I jokingly said, you know, we have some, some of our older church members here. The first week we came back, we're here. I mean, as soon as we open the doors again, we have church members that were here because... I've lived through World War II. I've lived, through, I've lived through a bunch of things. This doesn't scare me. And I think that's fascinating. As God has brought us through thing after thing, we become less frightened because we see God's track record. And that's what he's saying here. Rejoice. Have a deep confidence in who Christ is. He says rejoice in the Lord. And this joy can only come through an intimate, unshakable relationship with Christ. And again, this doesn't happen instantaneously. We don't ask someone who gets saved, a brand new believer, to now, you know everything about Christ, you know him intimately, and you don't. You have to get to know him. That's why we challenge. That's why, well, honestly, that's why we have a church where we come together and we disciple. We encourage each other. We provoke each other to righteousness. So we grow in this knowledge of who Christ is. Certainly we can trust Christ in a moment for salvation, but this kind of intimate trust takes time and experience. You think of marriage, you know, that idea of in a moment you say the vows. In one moment you're not married, in another moment you are. You exchange the rings. Um, the pastor who married my wife and I, he had a thing about kissing the bride. He wouldn't say it. He said, you may, you may salute the bride. And I don't know what that meant exactly, but it was weird. Uh, but at the end of that moment, now we're married, certainly. But we've been married. We're coming up on 18 years, right? 18? Yeah, 18. I, I rely on my, on my wife for all the math in our, in our home. But we're coming up at 18. I know her much better than I did at that moment. That moment of being, you know, the marriage moment, I know her much better. She knows me much better. Sorry. I'm sad that she has to. But... Uh, that's, the same, that's very similar in, in this concept here. The longer we're saved, the, the more we, we interact with our Savior, the deeper that relationship gets, the more trust we have, the more confidence we can have in him. So Christians rejoice. Jesus told his disciples in John 16, he says, so also you have sorrow now. They're getting ready for him to, to go. He's going to be crucified. He's going to leave them. He says, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. You're going to walk through this time of, of sadness, but I'm going to come back, and no one will take your joy. The disciples could trust Jesus in this moment, even though they would fail miserably, even though in the moment of, of, of the, the arrest, when they all scatter, 
They do fail miserably, but they have this trust in Christ because they knew him so well. Jesus didn't tell them this the moment after he picked them off the seashore and said, come follow me. He told them this after three years of walking with him and living with him and learning from him and seeing the ministry, participating in the ministry. Only after that does he tell them that no one will take their joy from them. So the real Christ follower, the true believer, will be getting to know his Savior, his Lord. He'll be getting to know his Savior so well that deep-seated confidence will naturally pour out of his life. That's his first characteristic. And we're all in the process of growing into that, but are you growing into that? Are you, is, is your trust and confidence for Christ growing? And not just, are you, are you just taking a leap of faith? There are, there are uh, uh, cults out there. There's uh, the Mormons, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. All have a leap of faith. You just believe. And that's never what we see in Scripture. God never says just believe. He gives us reasons to believe. He, he says taste and see. He says come let us reason together. Grow in this faith. But the challenge is, are you growing? Are you growing in this confidence, in this rejoicing in Christ? First first characteristic. Second, Paul goes on. He says, not only do Christians rejoice, but Christians discern. He says, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And this may be the most telling Christian characteristic exposing false faith in the American church. The lack of spiritual discernment among professing Christians is astounding and it's concerning. The American church has no discernment. Uh, you, you walk into, again, we always talk about Christian bookstores. I'm not, I'm not sure if any of those exist. But you walk into a Christian bookstore and you walk through the bestsellers some of those things aren't even Christian. At the best they could say is they don't have any swear words in them. But then even the ones that claim to be Christian are filled with, with pop psychology and unbiblical principles. And American Christians eat that up. We're buying millions of Joel Osteen books and millions of, uh, what is it, T.D. Jakes or T.D. I don't know, whatever his name is. Uh, there, there's these, these best-selling Christian authors that are, that are terrible. Terrible theology. And Christians have no idea. Paul warns Timothy about what's coming in his ministry. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in his closing words to Timothy, Paul says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience, that's big, patience, uh, complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. If he's not talking about the American church, I don't know what he's talking about. He's, honestly, he's talking about the first century church. Because this is how, how it's always been. There's always been false teachers. There's always been ear ticklers, right? Um, that's always been the case. And the Christian must have discernment. See, Paul here is not describing believers. These guys who have itching ears and accumulate for themselves teachers. These aren't believers. He's describing professing believers who don't know truth from error. I've heard the expression, being sincere, but being sincerely wrong. Have you ever had one of those conversations with somebody that, that you state a fact? It doesn't really matter what the fact is, but you state a fact and you're sure. And they, one of the worst things about having the, uh, the smartphones is people can check you. Check your numbers. You know, I've said this thing and, and my wife will whip out her phone and, nope, that's not accurate. That's not right. Or I'll say a number and she knows it just off the top of her head. Like, nope, that's not right. But... Uh, it, you can be sincere, but be sincerely wrong. If we come to an intersection, I truly think we should go left, but the act, our location is to the right. It doesn't matter how, how much I believe left is correct. 
I'm going the wrong way. I'm sincere, but it's sincerely wrong. And that's what, that's what Paul is describing. And that's what much of our American church is. Sincere, but sincerely wrong. Christians are called to discernment. 1 John 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. You have to fact check. And this is the day and age of fact checking, right? If, you're, if you spend any time on social media, there's always these fact checkers. And I think the fact checkers need to be fact checked, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it can be problematic both ways. But John tells believers, fact check these guys. The Bereans, when Paul would come in and preach, the, these Berean Jews would, would fact check him. They would break out the scrolls and they would double check Make sure what he was saying was accurate. The scriptures praise them for that. Have some discernment. Don't just believe the guy. He says to write the same things. This is not the first time Paul has said this, certainly. And it's not even the first time Paul has said this in this particular letter. In chapter 1, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you, and that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but, you, but, of, but of your salvation and that from God. So he's already said this once in this letter. Let's not think that Paul didn't, hasn't written this same thing before. He says, to write the same things to you is not a problem, but it's safe for you. It's a safeguard. It's going to keep you from tripping or stumbling. It's going to keep you from falling on your face. And isn't that what we want? I mean, as a pastor, you know, I don't want to fall on my face spiritually. I don't want to do it physically either. Uh, but, but we don't, definitely don't want to do it spiritually. I don't want to fall down on the job. As, as Bible-believing Christians ministering to the, your friends and neighbors and family, you don't want to fall on your face. So he says it's safe for you. It's a safeguard. The repetition is a safeguard. And then he gets into what we should be having discernment about. What should you be aware of? He says, look out for. It means beware. Be constantly observing to avoid. Now, the word look out for, this phrase is in the present tense. It's not a one-time deal. It's a con constantly looking out, paying attention. The Christian life, you can't set it and forget it. So be aware constantly. Now, Paul is going to describe the same group of false teachers in three different ways. So he's not talking about three different groups. He says, beware of the dogs, the evildoers, and the mutilators. But this is all the same people. It's all the same group. He's not talking about three different groups. The group is the Judaizers. We've talked about them. Uh, when we went through Galatians, we talked about the Judaizers. And what they were doing is they were trying to add works to faith in Christ. They said, hey, Jesus is wonderful. It's great. Trust in Jesus. But you should be a Jew too. Yeah, you should follow the Jewish laws. Yeah, you probably need to be circumcised. Yeah, that's, that's, that's big. You can't, be a, you, can't, you can't please God unless you're circumcised. And so they added these works to the gospel, which what we see from Paul in Galatians, anything plus, you know, Christ plus anything equals not salvation. Because as soon as I put some work into that, 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 that equation, that's where my trust goes. If I'm trusting circumcision, or I'm trusting a dietary code, or I'm trusting a dress code, I'm going to put my faith in that. Jesus becomes secondary, and that's not salvation. So these Judaizers specifically, they wanted these Gentile converts to be circumcised or to follow the Old Testament law. Now, in our daily lives, most of us probably won't meet very many Judaizers. You're not going to meet too many people that say, hey, you know what, you, you Gentile Christians, you should, all, you should become Jews today. You're not going to see a lot of that. But the, the principle is there, and you will see that principle. We're definitely surrounded by false teachers looking to add to the gospel or, or twist the gospel. How many churches in this area teach that you have to be water baptized to be saved? That's, that's no different than uh, 
then you need to be circumcised to be saved. I mean, we, we believe that water baptism is a command of God, but it's, a, it's a, a, an, an external proclamation of salvation. It's not a means to salvation. It, it represents the cleansing. It represents the, 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 the dying with Christ and the resurrection with Christ, the, the washing away of the sins. It represents that. It doesn't do it. We got well water. We're probably dirtier coming out than we are going in. I don't know. Um, but but the, adding, adding those kinds of things, or I grew up in churches that you know, really pushed a dress code, really pushed a you know, haircut, uh, certain types of music, certain translations of the Bible. And if you, if you step outside of those, man, you, you, you're not, you must not be in the faith. Well, you're adding work. Same thing these Judaizers are doing. So we do see it. We do see it. Maybe even the groups that say, hey, if you're, the only way you can be saved is if you talk in tongues. Or you, or you practice miraculous arts. Again, adding works, twisting the gospel. We do see it. He says, look out for dogs. The Greek word is kuon, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, kuon. It means the wild, dirty, dangerous scavengers. He's not talking about pets. In, a, in, our, in our culture today, dogs are pets. It is funny as you go around the world, and there's areas in the world where the idea of having a dog in the house is, why would you do that? They're, they're, they're filthy. And we're sitting here like we're kissing. My, my kids, I have to tell my kids, stop hugging the dog. Don't kiss the dog. Come on. It's... We like the dog, but no, come on. Um, but he's not talking about pet dogs. He's talking about these, these scavengers that run in dangerous packs. They're dirty, they're sick, they're dangerous. And it's interesting that, that, that Paul uses this, this language. And again, Paul is not, uh, he's not mean-spirited, but he's, again, he's not a wimp either. And so the, 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 the Orthodox Jews, the, the, the strict Jews, referred to Gentiles as dogs. And it was a, it was a racial slur. It was a, it was a term of contempt. You guys are dogs. You guys are garbage. We don't want anything to do with you guys. And Paul turns this, this slur that they would, would throw at Gentiles. And he's going to use it against them. But he's not just saying, oh, no, no, you are. You're the dog. He's not just calling them names. He's accurately describing them. Their doctrine was filthy. Their doctrine polluted the pure message of the gospel. When you start adding works, nobody was able to keep the law. That was part of the point of the law. When, when God gives the law on Mount Sinai and they read it, and this, I, always, I always find this fascinating, they read the law, and what does Israel do immediately? Well, do it. Got it. Excellent. They're happy. They're excited. They weren't listening. Because they should have been crying. They should have been ripping their clothes and, and, and throwing ash on their head and going, how can we do this? There's 613 laws. How do we keep these things? The Ten Commandments alone. If you ever do that, that, that uh, you know, do an exercise where you walk through the Ten Commandments, figure out how many of the Ten Commandments you've kept your whole life. If you've kept one, you're doing well. Maybe two, but there's no way you're batting 500. You know, there's no way. Even in those first 10, we can't keep them. No one's been able to keep them. So, so Paul says, you're, you're filthy, you're, you're polluting the gospel, trying to add works to the gospel. You're dangerous because you're drawing people away from the life-saving truth of the gospel. So he's not calling them names, he's describing them. You're filthy and dangerous. And as Christians, we have to be aware of that. We have to be on the lookout for false teachers that would pervert the gospel. He says, look out for evildoers. And evildoers, you could, you could, you could uh, uh, translate as evil workers. They're doing good works, well, good works in quotes, because the idea of you know, circumcision was a, a sign of obedience to God in the Old Testament. The, the, the dietary code was a sign of obedience to God. That was a good thing. But they're doing these good works with evil or prideful motives. Outward actions with the wrong inward motivations always turn into outward wickedness. If you're doing, if you're 
ostensibly doing the right thing, but for the wrong purposes, it's always going to end up turning into wickedness. It, it, it always will. You think of the example of the Pharisees. And in first century um, Jewish life, Pharisees, that was, you know, we talk about Phariseeism, and that, that's a, a synonym for hypocrisy. It's an insult. If you call someone a Pharisee, that's a bad thing. In their day and age, a Pharisee was someone to be aspired to. The Pharisees are incredible. They're the guys who scrupulously follow the law. And maybe they started out that way. Man, we, want, we love God. We love his law. We want to make sure we don't break his law, so we're going to add some more rules. We're going to, we're going to, fence, we're going to add some fences. I grew up in a church that this was their, their mode of operation. God says this, so we're going to set a fence over here so you don't, you know, if you don't break our rules, you won't break God's rules. Somewhere down the line, though, our rule becomes God's rule. And if you break our rule, oh, you can, must not be saved. So I, I've grown up in that. I've been aware of that. Well, the Pharisees who scrupulously follow the law, well, that turned into self-righteousness. As they start to feel like they're successful, hey, look how great we are, look how smart we are. Self-righteousness turned to rejecting the Messiah. When the Messiah, who they are the ones who have been talking about, they're the ones who, have, who should know, they should know him when they see him. When he shows up, they reject him. That's, that's what happens. And we see this, we see this in, our, in other areas of our lives. We see this even in today where we, we, we take the right thing, we do it for the wrong motives, and it turns into something wicked. Um, I always think of the Salem witch trials. And my, my daughter did a, a paper on the Salem witch trials, and I, I find it fascinating because the people who, who were calling for, they didn't burn any witches, mostly they, uh, they drowned them, uh, but the people who were calling for the death of these witches were, were, were Christians. They were church members. They were, they, they, they were religious people, except they weren't Christians. What had happened uh, in the, the 1600s, you have the, the, the Salem witch trials, about a generation before what you had had happen. I think I, I may have, have used this illustration before, but you had a group of people who weren't believers. Well, to be, a, to be able to vote in the colony, you had to be a church member. To be a church member, you had to have a salvation testimony. But you had a group of people who weren't church members. They weren't believers, they weren't church members, and they weren't allowed to vote. But they want to vote. We want to participate in our community. So the church leaders, the government leaders, very similar. Now, um, rather than just saying non-church members can vote, they thought that was a bad idea, they said, well, we'll let you non-believers join the church. As long as you're not scoundrels, you can join the church. If your parents are church members and you're not a scoundrel, you can join the church. And then you can vote. And that worked, that first generation. And then the second generation, you have unbelievers who are members of the church. Their kids are unbelievers. They're members of the church. Within a generation or so, you have the church filled with unbelievers. They're religious. They're superstitious. And then when the first weird crop or something wrong, somebody goes, Witch! And everyone follows suit. And they start, how, how many, I can't remember how many people died. 23, I think, something like that. I'm looking at my daughter. She's 23 people. 23 people died. And it's interesting because not everyone accused of being a witch died. If you confessed, they let you live. The only people who died were the people who wouldn't confess to being the witch. Probably the believers who weren't willing to, to lie. Um, but it's a fascinating thing that... Doing, the good, doing good works with the wrong motives always ends in wickedness, always ends badly. He goes on, he says, look out for the dogs. He says, look out for the evildoers. And then he says, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. The Greek word is katatomi. It means those who cut off. The, Greek, the, 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 the word for, for circumcision is uh, paratomi. And that means to cut around. It doesn't necessarily matter here, but they're two different words. Paul doesn't say, beware of those who circumcise. See, this, this, this word means mutilate, the people who cut off, the mutilators, the false circumcision. This is a harsh way to describe the Judaizers because they think of themselves as they're upholding the Old Testament law. They're doing what's right. And Paul says, you're nothing but mutilators. It's harsh, it's accurate, but it's harsh. 
Because circumcision was an outward sign of God's covenant with the Jewish people. It was meant to be an intimate symbol of the need to be cleansed. After the fall, uh, we're, we're, we're dirty, we're, we're perverse, we need to be cleansed. And th- this was a very intimate picture of that need to be cleansed. This, thing, this has to be removed. And we, and we get the, the, sometimes we wonder, why, why, why circumcision? Why, why that? Well, this uncleanness gets passed down to the children. So it's a very intimate picture of your uncleanness and your uncleanness, you pass it down to your children. That's, that, it's, a, it's a fascinating study. Maybe we don't spend time in it today, but, but it's a fascinating study. It's a, it's a symbol of a need to be cleansed. But this symbol of inward need became nothing more than an outward ritual and a point of pride. And that's the thing. As, as, as weird and, and crazy as this, this ritual was, it became a pride. I mean, this is what they said. We are the circumcision. Like, okay, that, 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 that's, that's odd. That's strange. But that became a, a source of pride. And again, these, these, these Jewish people... If you actually follow the law, you'd circumcise your children on the eighth day. So they're born, eight days later, you have them circumcised. So most of these people who were bragging about being circumcised, they didn't even do it. It was done to them before they could even remember. So they just, they just have always been like this. Now, they're the ones telling Gentiles who weren't circumcised at eight days old, adults who get saved, hey, you know what you, you, know what you need to do now? <laughs> like, whoa, you should have led with that. I might have changed my thoughts. But he calls them the, 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 the mutilators. The mutilators. They, 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 this isn't a, a way to please God. It's just, it became just a mutilation of the flesh. Rather than recognizing it as a constant reminder of the human inability to reach or please God, they became proud in thinking that this action could gain points with God. And we see that today in the, in, in the Christian circles with baptism. There are people that think baptism is going to gain points with God. Keeping the, uh, uh, the sacraments in the Catholic Church, they have seven sacraments. And if you keep them, you earn grace, which is a you know, com- complete oxymoron. You can't earn grace. That's the definition of grace. It can't be earned. But maybe even church membership or other good works. Those are all points in our favor. We're pleasing God by doing these things. So, so we still see this today. The principles still apply. So true followers of Christ must be growing in our discernment. We must recognize these false teachers, these false teachings. Just as our confidence and our trust grows as we get to know Christ better, so should our recognition of sound doctrine and false doctrine. As Christians, we can't afford to fall for the serpent's deceptive, did God actually say? Right? We go back to Genesis chapter 2. Eve fell for this. Eve had never met anyone who was deceptive. Uh, my, my personal opinion is that Eve was probably a day or two old. You know, do I look like I was born yesterday? Well, yes, you probably were. Um, I don't think Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden very long before they, they sinned. They don't have any children. There, there's, there's several reasons for that, but I think they're very new. She has never met anyone who was out to deceive her. She's never met anything that was dangerous, and this serpent starts talking to her. She's probably not even met all the animals. Doesn't even, she might not even really understand that animals don't talk. I, but what's the... What's the sales pitch? Getting her to question God. Did God really say? And you can maybe give her, give her uh, uh, some, some grace that she didn't know. We can't fall for that. It's been 6,000 years. Satan's playbook doesn't change. It's, it's, it's effective, but it doesn't change. Question God's word. Question God's goodness push us to, to, to want to sit on the throne ourselves. That, that's the playbook. We can't afford to fall for it. Have some discernment. Grow in your discernment. Learn God's word. So we've seen that Christians rejoice and Christians discern. As we move into verse three, 3, we'll see that Christians worship. And we'll finish up today with Christians worship. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. 
And again, that word circumcision mean, is the Greek word behind it is peritomi. It literally means to cut around. While the Judaizers claim circumcision as their own, Paul says not so fast. Actually, believers are the circumcision because of our faith in Christ. The real circumcision is of the heart, the true inward cleansing, not just an outward physical mark. In Romans 2, Paul says this, he says, uh, For no one is a Jew who is merely an outward one, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So Paul's very clear that this, this literal cutting off of part of the body, that's not what brings, brings peace with God. It was a symbol, but it's not the thing that brings peace with God. Now let's be very clear, because uh, there are groups, there are groups of, of American Christ, or cr- Christians around the world that would say that what Paul's saying here is that the church replaces Israel. And that's not what we're saying here. The church does not replace Israel. God made some very specific promises to ethnic Israel. The church doesn't just swoop in and claim them. So we're not claiming that you know, God is done with the Jews and it's all the Gentile Christians now. But Paul is clear that there are connections between believing Israel and the church. Or you, we, we, can't, we can't draw that high, high wall of, uh, of separation between the two. In Galatians 3, Paul says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And that was part of a larger section we've, we've studied and we went through Galatians. But those who the, the, the promise with, with Abraham was of because of Abraham's faith wasn't Abraham's works, it was Abraham's faith. And so those who have the faith of Abraham, Paul says here, are your Abraham's offspring. So there's a connection here. We're not, we're not throwing Israel away. I think God, is, God still has something for national Israel. God is still going to work. God doesn't, God doesn't fail in his promises. And all those Old Testament promises, not every Old Testament promise has been fulfilled yet. I think there's, there's still things that God is going to do with the nation of Israel. But there's a connection here. That's where we want to, that's what we want to focus on. This, this circumcision of the heart, the true cleansing. So Paul isn't going easy on these false teachers. He's used their own insults against them, and now he's taking their one fame to claim or one claim to fame. They got one thing. Circumcision's their one thing. That's what they call themselves. We're the circumcision. You have to do this to be right with God. And Paul's taking that from them. Paul's mean. Maybe not, but, but he's, he's not messing around. He doesn't play with false teaching. I think it's interesting because he, when, when people were preaching the gospel, but they were doing it out of, uh, out of uh, um, pride. They were preaching the gospel, trying to build up their own little kingdoms when he's in jail. He's like, I don't care. Preach the gospel. I don't care if people are following you as long as the gospel is being preached. But when it comes to false doctrine, he doesn't play around with that. It's not the same thing. So he says, uh, we are the circumcision. Now, what does that mean? How, how are we the circumcision? Well, he, he gives three things here. He says, first, we worship. We're the circumcision. We're the ones who worship by the Spirit of God. Worship is laturo. I think that's where, that's where we get the, uh, the, the term liturgy. You know, that's this idea of uh, respectful spiritual service. It means adoration, recognition of worth. And that's where, with, with our word worship in English, it's a, it's a contraction of the term worthship, recognizing the worth of something. I will honor you because you are worth it. It's important to understand that humans were created to worship, to recognize worth. We all, recognize, we all worship something. Ultimately, our worship boils down to worshiping God or worshiping self. We talk a lot about the old, uh, these false gods that the, the, the Romans or even the, uh, the, the Canaanites would worship, and they, w- they would worship Baal or Aphrodite or whoever. And 
but it, what it boiled down to is they were worshiping these gods so they could get something. You'd worship Baal because he, he was a fertility god. If you wanted, you wanted a, a good crop or you wanted to have kids, you would worship Baal because you would want to get something. At the end of the day, it comes down to I'm worshiping self. It's, it, everything I do is either for me or it's for the God of the universe. Christ followers recognize our creator and our savior's worth. This idea of worshiping. He says we worship by the Spirit or in the Spirit. So Christian worship isn't an outgrowth of our own cleverness. Sometimes we like to think that. I'm so smart. I saw the truth because I'm smart. And that's not what the scripture says. Christian worship is an outgrowth or a result of the Holy Spirit's indwelling and empowering. Our ability to worship God comes from the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Galatians 5, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Fruit grows, right? That, the picture here is a, of a tree, and what's growing out of that tree is the fruit, and it's from the Spirit. These characteristics all grow out of the Holy Spirit's presence and influence. So the Christians... They worship. They worship in the Spirit. Not only do they worship, but they glory. Uh, that word uh, he says glory in, uh, they glory in, G in Christ Jesus. So we glory. This word literally means to boast with exultant joy. Now generally we tell, we tell people boasting is bad, right? We don't boast. We don't, but to some extent it's what's our boasting about. That's, now this word boast or glory is used 37 times in the New Testament Paul uses it 35 times. This is Paul's word. This is Paul's pet word. And it's, it's fun, as you read through Paul's writings, you do start to see, uh, you know, he has some phrases. He has some, some phrases that he uses that the other guys don't. And this is one of them. So we boast. We're going to boast in Christ. The word itself is neutral. It does, it, the word itself isn't good or bad. It's the object of the boasting that makes it good or bad. So, so, depending on what you're boasting about, makes this word a good word or a bad word. In Galatians 6, he says, For even those who are circumcised do not, keep, do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. They're going to boast about how good they are because they got you to follow this rule. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So he uses the same word, boast, twice. One of the Judaizers boasting in their, their, physical, their, their physical abilities and himself boasting about Christ. So he says, we boast in Christ. The believers boast. His reason to rejoice, his source of confidence is Christ. Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again. That's where our confidence lies. That's where, if we're going to say, if we're going to tell, sell somebody, hey, you know who's really good? Who you know who really needs to be trusted? It's Christ. He's the worthy one. And again, the Christian doesn't brag on Christ to push the lost down. We don't brag on Christ, hey, our God's so much better than your God. Your guy's going to go to hell. That's not what we do. We brag on Christ. We, we rejoice in Christ. We, we talk about Christ's greatness to draw the lost to him. You need this Savior. That false God's not going to get it done for you. Working 90 hours a week so you can have money, so that you can, you can have all the, the luxuries. When you die, they're gone, and it's not going to work out for you. This Christ is what you need. And that's the picture here. We glory, we boast in Christ, drawing people to him. And then he finally says, we're the people, Christians are the people who put no confidence in the flesh. The true Christ follower knows that he cannot trust in his sinful flesh. We are all the worst sinner we know. We've talked about this a lot. We're all the worst sinner we know. We all have this inborn desire to run from God and rebel. We have it. That's our sin nature. 
spiritually speaking, without the Holy Spirit intervening, if I come to a crossroads and left is, is to worship God and right is to worship self, I will always go right. That's our inborn desire to rebel. So we can't put confidence in the flesh. Now there was a, a, another group of false teachers called the Gnostics in the first century. They were another group of false teachers in the early church. They taught the extreme that the flesh was unredeemable. They said that you can't trust the flesh. It's unredeemable. It's evil. So what they said is, well, then it doesn't really matter what you do with your body because it's dirty and gross anyway. So you can be as debauched as possible. You can get involved in all kinds of sin because it's a lost cause. So what they actually offered, they said, hey, in your mind, you worship God with your body you can go do all, you know, do, do all the wickedness. And that's not, you know, that's not what we're, we're, we're told in Scripture. We're commanded to keep our bodies holy. The body is not unredeemable. The physical universe isn't evil. But we do have this sin nature. And we can't put our trust in our physical goodness. We can't put our trust in our ethnicity. You know, for, for Paul, he's going to talk next week, you know, as, we, as we look at the rest of the passage, he's going to talk about his, his Jewish ancestry. And he says, if anyone could boast, it's me. And he walks through a pretty impressive list. But we do the same thing, right? We're Americans, right? We live in the promised land. We, 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 this is, this is uh, you know, Americanism and, and Christianity are one and the same, right? We, we, we fall into that trap sometimes. But I can't trust my physical goodness. I can't trust my ethnicity or my nationality. I can't even trust my religious deeds for salvation or grace in God's eyes. We don't put no confidence in the flesh. Our confidence must totally be in Christ. So we're going to end this passage. We're going to end today. We'll go to prayer. I'll ask uh, uh, Karen to come up and, and play a piano in a second here. We're going to end this remembering that Christian worship involves a couple things. It involves recognizing Jesus' worthiness. Jesus is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Christian worship involves confidently proclaiming his worthiness, telling people out there how worthy Christ is with the goal of drawing them to us. And it also involves recognizing and even proclaiming our own unworthiness. I have to recognize that. I have to recognize I'm unworthy. Christ is worthy. So just before we close, just before we go to prayer, kind of recap three distinguishing characteristics. Christians rejoice, confidence in Christ. We discern, we, we learn, we, we recognize truth from falsehood, and we worship. We worship in the Spirit. We worship, we glory in Christ Jesus. So as we, as we go to the Lord in prayer, just before we pray, I want to give you a chance to respond to God's word. I'll ask Karen to come up and, and play. If you're here and you're a believer, you're a Christian, you've trusted Christ, let me ask you, are you growing? I'm not asking if you're perfect. We know we're not. But are you growing in your rejoicing, that trust, that confidence in Christ? Are you growing in your discernment? Are you learning to, to recognize truth from error? Are you growing in your worship? Can you honestly say that Jesus Christ is your source for joy and confidence? If so, I want you to pray. I want you to thank God. I want you to thank God for his faithfulness, his, his goodness in your life. Ask him to continue to, to strengthen you in your growth. But if you're sitting here and going, man, I don't, I don't know that I am growing. I've, I've gotten way distracted by everything else. Confess that to Christ. Ask him for strength. Ask him for wisdom. Commit to growing in your faith. Maybe you're sitting here and you realize that I've never really trusted Christ. I've never put my faith in Christ. I've, I've trusted in my, myself being a good guy or a good girl, but I've never trusted Christ. I've never, I've never put my faith in him alone. Well, you can come to him today in repentance. You can trust him. You can, you can ask him for forgiveness. He will adopt you into God's family. So just for a moment, I want you to pray, and then we'll, we'll close.
Heavenly Father, again, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace, your mercy to us. We do pray that as we leave here today that you would continue to challenge and encourage us. Help us to grow in our, our worship, our, our rejoicing, our discernment. Help us to, to, to grow as believers and get to know you deeper and better. I pray, Lord, for anyone here who's not trusted you as their Savior, that, that, that needs to know the, the, the freedom of forgiveness, to feel that burden of sin, that, that guilt fall off, and to be adopted into your, your family. I, I pray that you would open that heart, open those, those, those eyes, let them see, draw them to yourselves. I pray that you would bless us as we leave here today, help us to glorify you, help us to proclaim your goodness, your worthiness. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.